My name is Adam Lowe. I'm one of the ministers here at St Bart's and it really is my profound privilege and joy to welcome you here tonight for our annual public lecture. In a moment, I'm gonna welcome Carl Fays up the front. So excited that you're here to join with us uh, tonight, Carl. Really looking forward to all that you have to share uh, with us this night and, and I know uh, people are really gonna benefit from it. So thank you uh, so much. But just a few housekeeping things as we uh, prepare to begin. It'd be really helpful to have your phones handy for the Q&A, but also to have them on silent. So if you want to check your phones, that would be helpful right now. But during the talk, you can text through questions. So our Q&A number is up on the screens on the side here. Uh, you can uh, text through. It's anonymous, so unless you put your name at the bottom of the text, OK? We're not going to know who, who it is. So you can uh, submit your questions, and then after the talk, we're going to get through, or try to get through, as many of those questions as possible. There will be an opportunity, as well as some roaming mics, to take questions off the floor, but really want to encourage you to, to text your questions in. You can ask whatever you like, and it will be great to hear Carl responding to those. I really encourage you to uh, do that. Tonight, if there was an emergency, we would let you know that we need to evacuate but the exits are simply straight up from where you came from, so through those doors and over to the side over here. But uh, we're really hoping there's no emergency tonight. So thankful that you're here, and I'd love you to put your hands together and welcome our guest speaker, Carl, up the front. We good? Thank you. All good. Well, well, Carl, we are, we're so thankful that you're here. We are full of gratitude, so thank you so much for, for being here with us. And it'd just be great, before we get started tonight, that we might just hear a little bit about you and sure. where you've come from. So you might just start by telling us uh, who your family, where are you from? Yeah, so I live in the Sutherland Shire, which is in the southern part of Sydney, just near Cronulla. Uh, we're inland from, the, the Sutherland Shire is kind of inland from Cronulla. You don't really care, but I'm just telling you. <laughs> uh, so that's where I live. I'm, I'm married to Jane. My wife, we've been married for a, a long time. Uh, we have three adult children and uh, four, five point five grandchildren. So. Uh, the, my son's uh, and his wife's baby shower is tomorrow, which I'll be missing, but that's their fault because it was supposed to be last week, but they've got COVID. Uh, and they got COVID last week, and so they had to put it off for a week. But uh, we're really, really excited about that. So grandchildren, uh, adult children, that's my life. Sounds great. Well, we could write a note, if you like, just to prove that you were here. <laughs> Thank so, you. So in your role in, in Olive Tree Media, yep. so sometimes you're described as a, a Christian communicator, but it just might be helpful for you to share with us what, what does it look like in an average week for, for Carl? Yeah, well, that varies enormously, actually. But um, the background to that is that I, I actually ran churches for a long time. I ran a fairly large church in Sydney for about 20 years. And, uh, and, but it, I kind of dabbled in media. So I was, I was um, hosting television shows. Uh, they, they used to have television shows on free-to-air channels, ch 7, 9, 10, you might remember some of those shows, <laughs> and I hosted some of those shows for a while, and then they asked me to do radio spots, so I did radio spots as well, so I sort of was doing that, and then after running the church for 20 years, uh, under the grace of God and just our thinking, we thought, you know, we feel like we should step out into this full time, so essentially we create resources that churches use to, uh, in, in, in their, ch their life of their church. So that's what we look to do. Um, and also, I've, <laughs> it's funny, you know, for two years, uh, we were at home. You guys were at home. Now, you weren't. You're up here. You're, you're out scot-free most of the time, weren't you? Uh, yeah, us poor saps in Sydney and Melbourne. Yeah. Praise God, we don't come from Melbourne. I um, mean, they're the most locked down city in the world. So for those two years, we didn't really go anywhere, Adam. But um, we, uh, so, so I speak a lot. So I've done a number of conferences on a regular basis. And, and, uh, and, and as a Christian communicator, it's really trying to let people know about the, the message of Jesus in a way that's contemporary, understandable, relatable. Um, and that's what we're trying to do, both in resources and also uh, when I speak publicly. Uh, we worked with some fairly large uh, Christian uh, broadcasters as well. So our shows have been not only just an Australian Christian channel, which is a, 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 a 
online channel or the channel here, but uh, TBN US, TBN UK, a uh, whole bunch of channels around the globe. But our, our, while the, the things that we produce, which we'll talk about later, um, are shown on Christian t channels across the globe, our greatest passion is that they would be resources for local churches. Mm. That's what we want to do. Mm. Well, we really appreciate that work and very appreciative of you. So tonight our topic is, is Jesus a game changer or is, is Jesus the game changer? So just wonder for you, when did you first come to realise that Jesus was a game changer for you? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. You probably, like for all of us, it's, you see that in the rear vision mirror, not at the time. Um, I often say when people ask me, why are you a follower of Jesus? I often say, let me tell you about my dad, because, uh, and I won't, but my dad's story is quite a remarkable one. So when I was two, he made a radical life choice. He came out of Germany, Second World War, no faith background. So that was quite a radical choice. So I won't tell you the whole details. That changed the trajectory of our family. Then in the middle of all of that, I had to make my own choice. And, uh, and what I did was, I was only 11, but then that's just continued to grow and mature and a, a call into um, working in, a, in the, the church scene uh, when I was still pretty young and I've been doing it for a long time. Hmm. Well, I'm really looking forward to hearing all that you have to say tonight. And just a reminder, don't forget, text through your questions tonight. And if you're joining us online, you can text to that number as well. We'll try to get through as many as possible. But would you put your hands together and welcome Carl again. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Thank you for the invitation to be here. So you can see, uh, when we, we're about to swap onto my PowerPoint, which is actually um, what we called Jesus the Game Changer, which is where the team decided to uh, call tonight uh, after this. So what is this? Well, Jesus the Game Changer is a series. It's a series of 10 episodes, and it was filmed in Australia, uh, in America, uh, India, a couple of shots in Singapore and in the UK. And essentially, Jesus the Game Changer as a series, what we're looking at is, you know, what influence did Jesus have? And we did a series before that, which was called Towards Belief. And that was about diffusing the belief blockers of our time. So people have, you know, I could never be a Christian or I could never, you know, be a part of a church or I could never kind of follow the Christian worldview because of this. And we're trying to say, well, what are, is there a reasonable answer to that particular issue? And that's like intellectual apologetics. Now, by the way, if you've never heard the word apologetics, it's not saying you're sorry, you're a Christian. <laughs> it's, about, it's about giving a defense for what you believe. That's what the word means, giving a defense for what you believe. This series is actually cultural apologetics. Now, the thing I need to say is that it, it, and, and when we were just chatting then, I, I talked about being a Christian communicator and I worked in a church. I don't have a PhD. I don't have a master's. I'm not one of those people that write 25 books and, you know, could, that's not me. I, I don't do that. What I try and do is, so if this is the issue, who can we find that can help people see the answer? Who, who around the, and basically, who around the globe can we talk to that would best respond to that particular issue? So in the series, if you get around to watching Jesus the Game Changer, and we'll talk about that a little later, if you get around to watching it, my job is as the interviewer host. My job is not the expert with all the answers. Uh, but in the process of being the interviewer host, in the process of meeting all these people, you start to meet people that have quite significant things to say, and it, in, it in, impacts what you think about the influence of Jesus. Now, there's a lot of discussion in Western nations, especially places like Australia, any Western nation across the world, America, the UK, there's this sort of significant question about, so is the church positive? You know, there's this notion that, well, Christianity is actually a negative influence within the community. Almost like Australia is a great nation. And if it wasn't just for the Christians messing it up, we'd be so much better off. And if you've been following football out of Sydney in the last week, case in point. And there's this notion that Christians and the church just get in the road. And it's a dangerous idea. As I think about 
before my life and over my lifetime of kind of being someone who's been a kind of public Christian in, in an odd sort of way, if you go back to the 50s, some of you will remember that, if you go back to the 50s, Christianity had a quite a central role. That doesn't mean everybody was a Christian or that we were a Christian nation, although a guy called Ken Inglis, who was a historian at the time, not a Christian, was writing for a well-known publication in Australia and basically said, on weight of numbers, you would have to call Australia Christian, like the number of people who went to church. Quite remarkable. And uh, so it was there, it was a kind of a central. And then you had the 60s and 70s and 80s, and it moved from being central to sort of a bit irrelevant. You know, it's just this is irrelevant, irrelevant thing. That's the, that's the religious people out the, the edge. They do that stuff. Then it moved again. And probably around, in fact, some people say Richard Dawkins around the uh, world, the attack on the World Trade Center in America, it moved religion... Christianity being in that bunch of religion, moved from being irrelevant to dangerous. And if you think about it, what do you do with dangerous ideas? What does a community do with dangerous ideas? Well, we pull them out of the public square, don't we? So if there's a dangerous idea that we think is not good for the community and we think is not good for people, we take it out of the public square. We take it out of the media. We take it out of education. We take it out of politics. We take it out of sport. So here's this notion that Jesus, the Christian faith, is actually a negative influence. And the question we're asking in Jesus the Game Changer is, is that reasonable? Is that a fair way of looking at the person of Jesus? And we, uh, we've done two series, and I actually want to start with two quotes, two clips actually out of our second series, but which answers this question. And the first, the first clip I want to talk to you, show you is actually by a guy, guy called Tom Holland. Tom Holland, not Tom Holland, who was the actor in Spider-Man, the other Tom Holland. So Tom, Tom Holland is not a Christian. And Tom Holland uh, is a Greco-Roman scholar, loved the Greco-Roman world, which he's about to say. But he then started, over, he's done some docos with ITV TV in the UK. He's written books about it, novels wrapped around the Greco Roman world, studied them deeply, but then became quite uncomfortable with what he was seeing. And here's what he says about the Greco Roman world. Tom, what drew your interest in the Greco Roman world? Um, I think the fact that they, uh, the Greeks and the Romans seemed glamorous, they seemed fierce, and they were extinct. And for me, it was a kind of seamless progress on from um, an obsession with dinosaurs. I was one of those boys who was absolutely obsessed by dinosaurs. Um, and I think that the, the qualities of a Tyrannosaur were pretty much what I enjoyed and appreciated <laughs> in a Spartan or a Roman army. The experience of actually writing about Greece and Rome, of of living in the minds of um, a Spartan king or a Roman emperor, I, I found them increasingly morally repellent. Um, you know, the, the, the Spartans killed disabled children without a qualm. They were highly praised for it. This was the index of their moral virtue. Um, Caesar, when he conquered Gaul, is said to have slaughtered a million Gauls and to have enslaved a million more. And again, this, far from being held against him, was a measure of, of, of everything that he had achieved. And I began to realise that there was a kind of a, a, a quality of callousness about classical antiquity that was utterly alien to how I thought and to how everybody I knew thought and to the moral presumptions that, that essentially governed the the society in which I lived. So I want you to just kind of let that linger in your mind. So we, we often, when we think about Christianity being dangerous today, tend to kind of look at the society that we're now living in. He's looking at the society that Jesus existed in. He's looking at that world, not, not today's Western nations. He's looking at that world. And you notice that I found them increasingly morally repellent. Now, the, he wrote this book called Dominion. Uh, the book, when we interviewed him, uh, the book wasn't out. It's out now. 
it's, a bo- it's a basically a book about the influence of Jesus across the globe. The one, the, this book is about 400 pages. Uh, and for your thinking, I'm not looking forward to reading 400 pages. You can actually go and Google this magazine article, which is only three pages. And it's much quicker and cheaper. And it's actually what first drew my attention to Tom Holland. I know this sounds pretentious, I apologise, but I was in London being interviewed by a guy and we'd just released Jesus the Game Changer. And he actually said to me, not this piece of paper, but he shoved this article across the table to me and said, you should read this article. And it was the article by Tom Holland. And the article is a precursor to the book. This is kind of leaning towards the book. And the article is called, Why I Was Wrong About Christianity. Now, hear me carefully right now. He's not saying he's a Christian. He believes the person of Jesus existed. He can see the influence of the Christian church. But he hasn't got to that point where he's saying, yes, I want to be a Christian. What this article does is it basically fills out what he was just saying there about the Greco-Roman world. And he's sort of looking at the Greco-Roman world, morally repellent, whether you just don't care about people. We'll kind of get to some of that as we go through this evening. And then he's looking at modern Western nations, democratic nations, and he's going, so how do we get from there to here? Like, what, what, is, what is the line between those two? And what, what uh, and he, let me just quote this. He says, it, it was not just the extremes of callousness I came to find shocking, but the lack of any sense that the poor and the weak might have any intrinsic value. That's what he saw in that world. And he's basically saying, so how do we get from that world to the world in which we now exist now? And he said, basically, the answer is Jesus. Christians and the Christian church. And he ends the article with this. I'm going to have another quote from him in a moment. He ends the article at this. The countries that were once collectively known as Christendom continue to bear the stamp of the two millennia old revolution that Christianity represents. He goes on to say that, you know, while the pews are a lot smaller, he says, I have learned to accept that I am not Greek or Roman at all, but thoroughly and proudly Christian. Now, he's not saying I'm a church-going believer in Jesus, but he's saying my values and what I hold to are actually Christian values. Here he says, this is out of uh, the, the uh, and if you ever get the book from the library or buy it, read the introduction, <laughs> gives you everything you need. Three pages of the introduction, you've got it covered. But here's what he says in the introduction. To live in a Western country is to live in a society still utterly saturated by Christian concepts and assumptions. 2,000 years on from the birth of Christ, it does not require a belief that he rose from the dead to be stamped by the formidable, indeed inescapable, influence of Christianity. The West, increasingly empty though its pews may be, remains firmly moored in its Christian past. Now let that sink in. He, oh, I'm assuming you're quoting, you're cheering the quote, not how I read it. But he, that, that was very good. Um, we're in an Anglican church too. You don't clap in an Anglican church. Goodness. Here's, or cheer. Uh, here's, here's the deal. Like, what is, he, what is he saying here? You don't actually have to believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus. You, you can leave that aside. What he's really saying is if you walk around the streets of Toowoomba, there are people right across this, this city and they're already influenced by Jesus. They just don't realize it. And the, and to push this a little bit further, there's a guy called Robert Woodbury, and he's, again, for season two. And he's, uh, he, he did a, a, a research paper, which is peer-reviewed, a serious research paper, peer-reviewed. He works now at Baylor University in Waco, Texas, although he did most of his research when he was at a university in Singapore. And it's called this, just let this name sink in, The Missionary Roots of Liberal Democracies the missionary roots of liberal democracies. And he was, he was sitting in a, a, a board in a lecture once, wondering about what he should do his dissertation on. And, uh, and, he, and there was a, he was, it was at, at Chapel Hill in the, in the United States, which is a university, a Christian university. And Kenneth Boland was the, the lecturer. And Kenneth Boland made this point. 
Bolin remarked that he kept finding a significant statistical link between democracy and Protestantism. Someone needs to study the reason for that link, because I don't know what it is. And Woodbury thought, I could do that. And so he did. And he spent the next number of years studying this. And it's quite a remarkable piece of study. Here's the summary of where he gets to at the end of his study. If you want to create a robust democratic nation anywhere around the world, if you want to create a robust democratic nation, go back 100 years and plant conversionary Christians. Now, this is important. It's not just do good Christians. It's not people who turn up and just be nice to everybody and feed them and care for them, as good as that is. I'm not criticizing that. He said, that doesn't make the difference. The difference is conversionary Christianity. And here is the summary of the difference that conversionary Christianity makes. Where you had greater Protestant missionary influence, you have higher literacy, higher school enrollment, more newspaper circulation, more book circulation, more voluntary association membership, um, uh, higher GDP, more medical bed, uh, hospital beds, longer life expectancy, lower infant mortality, lower corruption, and greater political democracy. So a lot of outcomes that most people think of are positive have an effect that's, uh, have, there's a strong association with where Protestant missionaries had more influence. As you can imagine, this research is not popular. This is done in serious universities. It's been peer reviewed. Now other people are taking up the same research. Sociology's departments really dislike what Woodbury's saying. But essentially, it's statistically robust. He, one of the examples, he goes to a capital in Tonga, the capital of Tonga. And so he's looking at Tonga on one side of the, the border and Ghana on the other. Now, this is really complex if you think about it. So he's trying to go to places where, where is it geographically the same, kind of ethnically the same, the same group of people. It, it, it's basically the same area of the world, but because of a border of nations, there's a different there's difference on either side. The only thing that's different is, is who's been running the show, if I can use that term. And he goes to Tonga, and he went to, to, went to the university at Tonga's in the, in the campus library. This is in 2001. He said the shelves held about half as many books in his own personal library, in the campus library in Tonga University. Uh, um, Togo, not Tonga. Togo, thank you. Tonga would happen to be sitting in the middle of the Pacific. Togo would be in Africa. Let's get that clear. And he, and he, and he, said, where do, he said to the students, this is just a few years ago, this is not 50 years ago, and he said, where do you buy your books? And he said, oh, oh, the answer was, oh, we don't buy books. The professors read the text out aloud and we transcribe. He crossed the border to the University of Ghana's bookshelf and Woodbury would see floor-to-ceiling shelves lined with hundreds of books, including locally printed texts by scholars. And he says, a huge contrast, just on two sides of a border. And this is now. This is not generations ago. And this is what, the, the, what he said. That during the colonial era, British missionaries in Ghana established a whole system of schools and printing, and printing presses. But France, the colonial power of Togo, resisted, restricted missionaries. The French authorities took interest in educating only a small group of the elite. Now, we'll come back to this a little bit later in this talk. But essentially what Woodbury's saying is from research, conversionary Christians are not a negative influence. They, they make a huge positive impact in the nations that has lasted generations so what are some of the differences that Jesus makes? And one of them is this whole notion of equality. The, 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 the basic foundation of Western democratic nations is that we are all equal. We are of equal dignity, equal value, and equal worth. If you go around the shopping centres uh, just down the road here that I'm staying near, uh, at, at the ridge I think it's called, and you walked around bumping into strangers and asking them questions, don't do it, it's socially unacceptable, but let's just say you did. Then you said, do you think all people are equal? You'd be very hard-pressed to find somebody who said they weren't. 
in this nation, we had an election just a little while ago when Anthony Albanese put a mark on his, uh, 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 on his um, ballot, it was worth exactly the same as yours. Think about that. That's a remarkable thing. We, we have arguments, well, I'm going to come back to this later, we have arguments about how we should care for people. But we give dignity and worth to everybody in this nation. We don't always get it right. We don't always do it right. We don't treat everybody equally. I know that. But as a foundational level, that's what we hold to. Here's John Ortberg. We interviewed him in um, San Francisco. That idea from ancient Israel that every human being is made in the image of God, um, that's an idea that we all tend to take for granted. It didn't exist in the ancient world. In other creation myths in the ancient Mesopotamian world, the idea was the king might have been made in the image of the primary God, but the poor, the slaves, were either not made in the image of any God or in the image of a much inferior God. So this notion that every human being, male and female, is made in the image of the God, the creator of all things, has quite explosive implications that took a long time to work out. And it's really Jesus who brought that notion of the dignity and worth of every human being from little Israel to the much larger world. The point that John Urbeg is make, making there is in the time of Jesus, e equality didn't exist in the ancient world. And it's really the same concept that, that um, Tom Holland is saying. In that world, people weren't all treated as equal. That great thinker mind, Aristotle, actually believed that slaves were a subclass. They weren't, they weren't human, they were a subclass of people. And they could be quite treated as a subclass of, of people. You could go out and buy a pick, you could go out and buy a shovel, you could go out and buy a slave. It was pretty much the same. It was just something that you owned. And, and interestingly, because the, the, if you talk to people now, there's a sense of, we'll be, we've always thought people are equal. We've always treated people equal. That's just, we pop out of the wound, the first thing we say is everybody's equal. You know, there's this notion that it's just the air that we breathe. Because it's the air that we breathe, we don't realise it actually had a plate. There was a time when pe people didn't hold to that. And, and even across the globe, equality is not part of all societies today either. We interviewed a guy called Vishal Mangalwadi, who wrote a book called The Book That Made Your World. It's a, bit of, it's a book on the same theme as this, this series. And if we get time, I'm looking at the time, we'll, you'll hear from Vishal Mangalwadi a little bit later. But Vishal Mangalwadi, as somebody who lives in India, reflects on the Hindu faith. The Hindu faith holds to two things, karma and reincarnation. Now, hear me carefully. I'm not suggesting that people in India don't care about anybody else and they're all terrible people that treat everybody badly. I'm not saying that. But there's something about where Christianity points you to the dignity and worth of all people, which I'm going to say something about later, where that comes from. If you believe in karma and reincarnation, where do you end up? Well, they have a stratified society where you have the Brahmin caste at the top and the Dalits at the bottom, and then there's literally, we discovered when we were filming in India, literally millions of people below the Dalits, the untouchable people within Indian society. And if you hold to a Hindu philosophical worldview, which says this, we don't ever kind of die and just go away, we keep coming back, and we come back, and we come back. And what you come back as is determined by how you lived. That's the whole karma idea. So if you're a Brahmin class, if you believe in the notion of karma and reincarnation, if you follow that worldview and you're in the top Brahmin class, the wealthy, the powerful, the influential, what do you think about your position if you take a Hindu worldview? Well, it's a total sense of entitlement. Of course, I don't know what I did in my last life, but by Gosh, it must have been good. And at the other end of the scale, there's a notion that at its worst, I'm not, this doesn't happen all the time, but at its worst, they don't, want to, they don't want to help anybody else on the bottom end of the scale. You know why? Because I don't want to mess with their karma. They've got to work out their karma through this life. And when you work out your karma in your life, you'll come back at a better life. Christians don't believe in karma. We believe in grace. Then we believe that we're all created equal under God. But it, what we're trying to say, and let me just go to that, why, why do we believe in the dignity and worth 
of all human beings? Why do we believe in the equality of all human beings? In a lot of ways, if you look at a whole bunch of different worldviews about how you get there, Genesis 1, verse 26 and 7 says that God created us in his image. In his image, we are created. In other words, the spark of God is within every person. Now, interestingly, if you believe in evolution, so you don't believe in God, we're, we're here by chance over billions of years, natural selection, etc., etc. That doesn't necessarily lead you toward a position that says we're all equal and equal of equal worth. In fact, it actually points in the other direction. Now, I'm not saying the people that believe in in, in evolution or, or, or the sense that uh, there is no God uh, are people that don't care about anybody else. I'm not trying to say that. What I'm saying is that one of the reasons we believe in the dignity and worth of all people because we believe that, that the spark of God is in within all people. And the spark of God is within the disabled kid and the billionaire. The, the spark of God is there. That's what gives us our dignity and our worth. There's this notion also where Paul talks about equality and one of the things that, that um, Tom Holland talks about, and it talks about in his book, and we've got a little bit of a clip of this in, in uh, Jesus the Game Changer Season 2, is he, he writes about how the explosive nature of Paul's writing in the New Testament. Now, in our society, in our time, in our day, Paul's kind of looked on a little bit, you know, a bit of a misogynist, not particularly helpful, you know, a lot of what he wrote. And yet, there are places where Paul writes things that we don't actually see how explosive they are. In, he writes to a church, in, uh, the, the church in Galatians, a uh, gathering, a, a wider group, and he actually says these words, For therefore there is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female, we are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, you, some of you would have heard that before. Now, by the way, I'm only quoting the Bible not to say this is authority and you must listen to it. It's just a way of looking at how Paul thought or looking at what Jesus said, which we'll get to eventually. That's just to say, here's, here's what we know about what Paul wrote. And when Paul writes this, that was an incredibly radical thing to say. In a world that was completely stratified, in a world that saw slaves as tools, in a world that saw women, which we'll get to, as, as, as possessions of the men in their lives with no rights. In a world that separated, especially the Jewish people, separating themselves as the chosen ones from everybody else. And Paul says, no, all, all, those, all those boundaries, they're all gone in Christ. Now, the intriguing thing is, that's, all these years later, we read that and go, yeah, of course. But at the time, that was radical. At the time, that was different. At the time, that was revolutionary. In this whole area, there's a guy called Larry Seedentop who's written this book, um, Inventing the Individual. Now, we were going to interview Larry Seedentop. He's, he's in the, his 80s then. Uh, he was quite unwell, he was, and he, uh, so we weren't able to interview him. I don't think, as far as I know, that Larry Seedentop is a Christian person. Uh, but he wrote this book after his study at Nebel College in Oxford University, where he was dec in decades, he was a professor at Oxford University in Nebel College. He wrote this book, Inventing the Individual. Again, this is about 360 pages, this book. Uh, that, this is a book where you, you, you read the summary at the end, and that gives you everything you need to know. Go to the library, get the summary. The introduction to Tom Holland's book, the summary of Larry Seedentop's book. Here's one of the things that he says in the summary of that book. Christianity, get what he's saying? He's looking at this from a historical point of view. This is not a religious statement. Is that clear? This is not religion speaking. This is not a person of faith selling an idea. This is a reflection on history as he sees it. And he writes it from pre-Roman times all the way through to today. Same as Tom Holland, but where does he get to? Christianity changed the ground of human identity by emphasizing the moral equality of all humans quite apart from any social roles that they might occupy. That's what, that's what Paul is just saying. What he's saying is those words of Paul changed how the world thought about individuals and people. And he goes on to say, Christianity changed the name of the game. 
Social rules became secondary. They followed and in a crucial sense had to be understood as subordinate to a God-given human identity, something all humans share equally. He's looking back over the span of history and he's saying, the teaching of Jesus, the teaching of Paul and the church changed how we think about equality of individuals. What about the place of women? The, the, the place of women in the Greco-Roman world was not a great place to be. Uh, as we said, you, you, if you wanted to go to court, you, your husband, your brother, your father had to go with you because you had no standing in court. You could be divorced on a whim. Most men apparently had a wife and then a concubine for their other needs. Basically, a woman's job as a mother, and they were often married in their early teenage years. They were often married to older men, and they were often just basically at home to produce male children. And in that setting, uh, women had no rights and, and few rights. And Jesus was revolutionary when it came to women. In, in Luke chapter 8, 1 to 3, it talks about Jesus and those who are around Jesus. And it mentions three women. Now, here's an interesting thing. It mentions three women that supported Jesus out of their own means, which says something, doesn't it? So it says that there were women that had a place in society and there were women that had some means. You'll know that when Paul went to a place called Philippi, he's doing his missionary thing, and he meets a lady who is a trader in purple cloth. Like that was an expensive, that was expensive cloth. She was a businessman. No, she was a businesswoman. She was, she was a business person and she was very good at it. So it's not to say that they, they were all in that subjugated position. But as a general overview of society, they didn't really have a position. In John chapter 20, what verse, uh, 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 this is the story where Jesus raised from d dead. And there's a lot of people who think, oh, well, they just, the church just made this up. Jesus didn't rise to dead. Yes, he might have been a historical figure, but I don't think the resurrection... They, they're writing the story. So the early church is writing the story of what happened. Who is the first G person that Jesus actually speaks to in the story that John writes about Jesus' life, Jesus' biography? And when John writes the biography of Jesus, the first person to see a risen Jesus was Mary Magdalene, a woman. Now, here's the deal, as an aside almost. If you're making the story up, if you're sitting around brainstorming the story, do you reckon you'd make a woman the first person that Jesus spoke to? Because that wouldn't make a lot of sense if you're trying to sell the story at that time, in that age, in that culture. The only reason you would write down that Mary was the first person that saw Jesus alive is because Mary was the first person that saw Jesus alive. That would be the only place you'd put it there. But it does show that the place, that they didn't sort of squirrel that story away because it didn't fit the narrative of the community at the time. There it is, front and centre. And then there's this third story about Luke in Luke, where Luke tells a story about Jesus and his teaching and what he did. And as a, as a kid, as a teenager, this is a story that ticked me off seriously. Um, and, and some of you might remember this story. There's two ladies called Mary and Martha, sisters, and they were good friends of Jesus. And Jesus would visit them regularly. And then there was that story where their brother Lazarus, di Lazarus died. So that's that part of that story. Anyway, this one, Jesus turns up to their house. And as you can imagine, you can't just bang something in the microwave or whip down to Coles and grab a frozen pizza and put it in the microwave. Preparing a meal for somebody took a long time. It was a lot of work. And, uh, and it had to be, you start, from, you, know, you start from scratch to create a meal. And when they get there, so I'm reading the story as a teenager, and, and here's Mary. She's, she's, uh, she's, she's sitting in the lounge room talking to Jesus, and Martha's in the kitchen, you know, whipping up this meal. And halfway through, Martha comes in to Jesus and said, do you reckon you could ask my sister to give me a hand with the meal? And Jesus' response was, Mary's chosen the right thing. It won't be taken away from her. And I used to think, oh, how slack is that? There's Mary pretending to be spiritual, getting out of all the work. Poor Martha out there doing it all herself. And partly because I was a kid. But the thing I missed about the story was, women didn't learn in those, days, those times. Women weren't supposed to sit with rabbis and teachers and rulers, those who, who taught other people. Women didn't, never learnt. That wasn't their place. They were never given those opportunities. 
And what is Jesus saying? She has a mind. She's going to learn. And it's not going to be taken away from her. I'm going to give it to her. Here, here's this person, Jesus, in history, who is giving dignity and worth and teaching and place and opportunity to women that was not available at that time. There, there are discussions in our days about uh, whether there's equality of women and the gender pay gap and all of that, and, you know, there are things that we should respond to. You can't imagine the different lives that these women had. Totally different. And even Paul's, Paul's teaching is significant as well. Now, everybody gets uptight about the fact that Paul says in this passage, I won't read it all, but there's one state, place in this passage where Paul says, um, hu- wives submit to your husbands, and everybody's like, oh, shock, horror, you know. Um, now, and, and yes, if, if any man takes that to a, a degree today that you must submit to me, then basically you're a goose and you should get over yourself and read the Bible properly. But moving on, the interesting thing is to think about that world again. I'm going to quote another thing later called the Delphi Canon. Now, the Delphi Canon was like a self-help book of 600 BC. And the Delphi Canon, 600 BC, 600 years before Jesus, the Delphi Canon had 147 pithy statements about how to be a good person, how to get on in life, how to succeed, you know, all that sort of wisdom literature. Do you know what one of the Delphi Canon's um, positive thoughts was? It was, uh, where, where is it? I've got it here. I had it in my head and it just went. The Delphi Canon was basically uh, it, it, it was saying to husbands, rule your wife. That was the Delphi Canon of advice to men. Rule your wife. What does Paul say? He says to these men, mostly older, with younger wives, in a society where you could divorce them at a whim and you could treat them however you like, Paul says, you know how you should be treating your wife? The same way Jesus treated humanity. And we believe that the person of Jesus died on a cross and gave himself completely for humanity. In other words, basically gave himself up for all of humanity. So men, you want to know how to treat your wife? There's a good example. There's the place to start. You have no idea what a radical concept that was. In a privileged, male-dominated society where you could do whatever you like because your woman, your wife was your possession, Paul is saying... Give yourself to these women. It's no wonder that the church grew in the early years. And part of it was, it was so much better life. In this, in, in, in this setting, and then there's that same passage out of Galatians again. In, in this setting, the other thing that happened was that, that women were so poorly thought of. And children, I just skipped the children bit, but children were so poorly thought of that basically if you had a girl, they were actually an economic burden to the family. They were not positive because you had to give a dowry and you had to marry them and it was expensive and, and they couldn't really provide for you in your older life. And there was this thing called exposure that most of us don't think about today but was actually a very normal part of the Greco-Roman world. And it was this, uh, Joe Vitale, brilliant lady, uh, now in America, but was, we interviewed her in Oxford. And here's what we talk about the place of women. So Joe, this, this thing that you've mentioned, exposure, mm. give us a picture of what that would look like. Yeah, so exposure in that context, it basically refers, I mean, quite literally to the practice of, of taking out your child, but perhaps because you're in horrible poverty and you just have no way of supporting them and there's no other option for you. So you go out with your child probably at night when, when no one can see you and there are a lot of texts that refer to children being left at somewhere like the rubbish tip or, you know, the garbage heap where a child would just be be left out, basically exposed to the elements um, and, and two things would happen. Either someone would occasionally you get instances of you know children being found in in that situation and taken and brought up in a household where they may become a slave um, and all, all these children would just die was it true that most of those exposed or the higher percentage of those exposed were girls yes that's right i mean you know occasionally you'd find instances of men as well i think you know just just because some people would be in such extreme poverty that they couldn't even you know feed an, a, another mouth but on the whole it would tend to be women because they would be seen as a drain on the economy of the household rather than an asset one of the things that tom holland was said to us in his interview 
and we were talking about this whole issue of exposure. He said that one of the ways that uh, archaeologists date digs in the Greco-Roman world is that they would look at the drains. And many times uh, in the years gone past, they would find in the drains all these small bones. And there was the thought that the small bones were animals. And they took, took a closer look, and the small bones were actually baby's bones. And what they discovered is what Tom Holland would say is one of the things that they do now if they're trying to date a dig is if there's baby bones in the drains, it's pre-Christian. If there's no baby bones in the drains, it's post-Christian. And here is this notion that uh, children aren't really worth that much. And exposure was, again, just a normal part of their society and their life, as abhorrent as it sounds. I'm going to jump through a whole bunch of slides, try not to watch them, because this is going to take longer than we thought, so, or longer than I thought, mainly because I talk too much. It comes with the territory. Uh, let me go to care uh, and, and Jesus on care. In Jesus in Matthew chapter 25, verse 40, said something that, again, it's one of these things that we don't really think about how radical this is. In chapter 25 of Matthew, uh, Matthew tells a story where Jesus is giving an example. Uh, it's kind of like a parable. A parable is not like a true story, but it points to a, a bigger reality. And this story in Matthew chapter 25 is this picture of the end of the world and the king is judging all the people. Now, the king is sort of seen as God in this setting. And God is judging all of humanity. So there's humanity spread out in this parable, this apocalyptic sort of picture. And, and God is judging the people. And then God separates. Now, by the way, as a Christian who reads the whole of the Bible, you've got to take this in the context of the whole of the Bible. Because this sounds like you earn your way into heaven. You know, all the people that worked hard enough get there, and all the people who didn't work hard enough don't get there. We believe in grace, so we've, we've got to balance this up because Jesus is making a particular point out of this parable, not saying this is how you get to heaven. But in this story, he's separating the sheep who are on the right from the goats who are on the left. The sheep on the right are the good ones, the goats on the left are the not so good ones. And Jesus, when he's he, in this telling this story, um, he, he, and he says to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared to you from, for, prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. Do you remember this passage? I was, I, um, I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And he's saying this to the sheep on his right. Good on you guys. Thank you. Into the heaven. This is a slightly mind, very rough interpretation of what then happens. And the sheep are about to go into their eternal glory and they turn back to, to God and they say, we're really pleased to be sheep on the right, not goats on the left, and we're pleased to be going into your eternal glory and we don't really want to lose our spot. But we do want to ask you a question. When exactly do we see you in prison or naked or a stranger or needing a help? Because we reckon we might have remembered. And we don't remember when it happened. So can you give us a picture of when we did that? And Jesus said this. The, the king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did to the least of these my brothers and sisters, you did for me. That, those words, changed the world. Absolutely changed the world. Because all of the people who became followers of Jesus in the years to come, in a society that did not care if you had no one looking after you, they remembered who they followed. And they remembered, hey, we're with the guy who said, whenever you do something for the least of these, you do it for me. So we're going to turn up for the people most in need. Here's Rodney Stark reflecting on that. Rodney, what was it that Jesus taught that the early church picked up on that kind of shifted? Well, I suppose the main thing he taught is that life was sacred. That uh, the life of everyone, that people were to take care of one another, that we were our, our brother's keepers, that, uh, uh, that we had a responsibility to look after the old and the young and the disabled and the ill. Um, you know, it showed up incredibly 
during the two great plagues that hit the Roman Empire very early in Christian days. Um, the wealthy Romans fled the cities when it happened, including the physicians and the priests. The Christians stayed, they nursed the ill, took care of people, and as a consequence, some of them, some of them died of the plague, of course. But Christians survived the plague at a much higher rate because, as a matter of fact, uh, if you give people food and water and care for them during the height of their illness, many of them will survive. And so there I was apparent to all these pagan neighbors that the Christians were outliving them uh, because they're taking care of one another. So that guy is Rodney Stark. He's written a number, about 40 different books. Again, I, I talked to Robert Woodbury and I said, do you think Rodney Stark is a Christian? And he said, no, I don't think he is. He lectures in sociology at Baylor University in Texas. And he's, he's written a whole bunch of books about the influence of Christianity. Tom Holland is a new version of Rodney Stark. They're just looking at history and they're going, these guys changed the world. And one of the ways they changed the world is they cared. And, and it, what he was saying there was the early response to the plagues are in, instructive. There's one about AD 75, I think, another one. I've got these dates. I haven't remember, remembered these lately. 251, I think, was the second one. And literally 25 to 30 percent of the whole population died. Like, I mean, seriously died. They didn't, didn't, didn't just go to hospital. They were dead. And, and, and when that happened, and you don't know what's going on, and you don't know how to save yourself, as he said, the priests left, the, the physicians left, the wealthy people left, everybody left. When I say priests, they're the pagan priests. Everybody left. The only people that stayed were the Christians. In fact, there's actually a, pl a plague called the Plague of Cyprian. Now, Cyprian was a bishop. <laughs> so I want a plague named after me. But uh, why was he linked with the plague? Because everybody's going and Cyprian's saying to the Christians, we, we're staying. This is our job. We, we, we follow the guy who said, whatever you did to the least of these, we will stay. Now, there's an interesting guy a little bit later whose, whose name uh, was Julian the Apostate. I mean, being named after a plague is not so great. Being named as an apostate is not so good either, I guess. But Julian was... You know that Constantine became the emperor and Constantine was a Christian of sorts. He didn't make Christianity the, the religion of Rome, but he, he, he meant that it was legalized and he saw himself legalized. It was, they stopped persecuting Christians. And in, the, in this time, the Christianity grew and became quite significant and prominent. Julian followed after, after Constantine, and he was kind of Constantine's nephew. But Julian was no Christian and no fan of Christians, and that's why he's called the apostate. And Julian was really annoyed with Christianity and wanted to get rid of Christians and Christianity out of the whole of the Roman Empire. So he wrote to the pagan priests, and he basically wrote to the pagan priests and said, these Christians are making us look bad. They're out there caring for the poor and the sick and the needy. You need to get out and do the same. Because they're, we're looking bad against what they're doing. And as, as scholars have written, they, it never happened. you know why? Well, Julian died. That was always a bit of a da bummer for his, pro for his program. But the reason the, the pagan priests didn't do it, because they didn't believe it. It wasn't a part of their worldview. It wasn't what they held to. People who followed Jesus followed the guy who said, whatever you do the least of these, my brethren, you do for me. And they gave themselves to these people. I'm going to quickly do two other things. Uh, I'm, I'm stretching my friendship here. Hang in there with me. Humility and leadership. You know, in democratic nations, we really like to see a servant heart in leadership. We don't actually believe they do it. It's a bit like, just fake it, please. They just pretend you're trying to serve, at least. And we, we don't really warm to arrogant, proud full of themselves leaders, do we? We like to see, and i, I got to say, you know, I think Anthony Albanese's politics and policies are a fair way from where I would stand. Decent guy, though, isn't he? That's what I think. Decent guy. And, and, and he comes across as somebody who genuinely cares. Now, whether he does or not, I don't know. But he, if, he does, if he doesn't, he's faking it well. But here's this deal, that that's what we want in leadership. Where did that idea come from, that we like humility and leadership? Because... Uh, Humility was not a virtue in the Greco-Roman world. 
Humility was actually a vice in the Greco-Roman world. It was seen as a weakness. And Jesus on two occasions, in John chapter 13 and Matthew chapter 7, John chapter 13 is the story where Jesus washes his disciples' feet. Again, we, we know that story well. So we just kind of, oh, yeah, 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 that happened around Christmas. I mean, Easter, one of those two. Well, I think it was Easter, wasn't it? Easter? You know, so that, didn't it happen? And, and Jesus washes his disciples' feet. The Pope washes people's feet. That's a good thing. Think about this. Jesus is the rabbi, the leader. Jesus knows his position in the universe, as it were. He sees himself as God's son. That's where Jesus sees himself, in that position. In a, in a world where, in that Matthew chapter 20, Jesus is saying, you know, you know the, the, the Gentile leaders, you know how they just lorded over people. Now, any Gentile leader hearing Jesus say that wouldn't have, said, wouldn't have been offended. They would have said, absolutely, of course we do that because that's our job. We're in charge and we're not going to bow down to anybody else. We only bow down to people that we see, that we believe are higher than us. And Jesus comes to this meal. The meal's all prepared. The logistics team was not doing a great job because the one job that there was no one to do was to wash people's feet. Now, keep in mind... This wasn't like a ritualistic thing. This was about hygiene. If you're in the Middle East, as a bloke, walking around in sandals, let's put the fashion faux pas aside, but walking around in sandals in a hot, dusty environment, and you go into a room that's not very large, and then you recline at a table. In other words, you lie on one elbow and you put your feet out behind you. It's not a very pleasant meal if people, somebody hasn't washed people's feet. So the worst job in the place was to wash everybody's feet when they came in. The lowest servant did that job. The person, the bottom of the lung, rung, that's what they did. And you imagine the disciples turn up, there's no one to wash feet, they're looking around, who's going to do this? And Jesus, there's this little piece where he says, Jesus, knowing he came from God and knowing he's going to return to God, that's just how John records that little story. Now he knows his place, wraps a towel around his waist and washes their feet. A remarkable, a remarkable act of service and grace extended to these people. In the Delphic ca canon, the one I was just told you about, there's 147 statements, and I just said one of them was to rule your wife, about how to live a good life. Guess what doesn't exist in the 147 statements? Humility never gets a mention. Yet, today, Jim Collins wrote his book, um, a business writer, a researcher, has written Good to Great, and, uh, which has just sold millions of copies around the world and all big corporations around the world use this book. And he talks about level five leadership. And level five leadership is what he believes is the most effective leadership to get your company from a good company to a great company. I don't mean because it's a nice place to work. I mean they make more money. That's what he's talking about. So how do you get from being a good company to a great company with commercial output? And he looked at the leaders and he said, the best leaders are marked by two traits, two human traits, two values that they bring to their leadership. You know what they are? Fierce resolve and humility. Uh, 147, and it doesn't get to mention. Jim Collins comes up with, with two and it's there. Here's Patrick Lencioni again. Neither of these guys are Christians. They're just looking at the world and saying, what makes the best in the world? Patrick Lencioni writes a book on, on the ideal team player. And the ideal team player has three traits. Guess what one of the three is? Humility. So how do we get there? How do we get from, uh, how do we get from it being a vice to it being a virtue? And what, what historians like John Dixon you're about to hear from will tell us is that historically the turning point is the cross. Here's John Dixon. The historical moment that changed everything was not so much his teaching, but his crucifixion. Because in the crucifixion, power is given up in such a, an extraordinary way. The cross was viewed, crucifixion generally was viewed as the ultimate punishment in the Roman Empire the lowest point in the world, you could say. And yet, the Christians believe Jesus chose to go there. Not that he was humbled, not that he was crushed, but that he'd willingly given himself. And so they had, they had a choice. Does this mean Jesus wasn't as great as we thought? Because there he is on a cross. 
or does it mean we have to change what we think about greatness? It really does seem that the turning point, and when I say this, I just mean it historically, not theologically. The turning point in history, in terms of this motif of the humble leader, is the crucifixion of Jesus, where the Christians spotted that to be truly great means to lower yourself for the sake of another. Remarkable change. Let me jump forward uh, through these two. Um, gosh, that's, I'm really disappointed. But anyway, moving on. Because we can't be here all night. Isn't that great news? The great news is I can see a clock and I'm paying some attention to it. Here's, what I, here's, here's one of the things I want to wrap with, though, but, which I think is really important because there's a, there's a, a, a misnomer, a, a false message you could get out of what I'm saying. You could come out of this and go, okay, Carl, I think I've got the point you're making. The person of Jesus came into the Greco-Roman world and brought a whole bunch of cultural changes and they changed society and Western nations are a different place because of the cultural changes that Jesus made and that's a good thing. So that's, that's the, why Jesus is a game changer because he made those cultural shifts. And I would say to you that's kind of in the big picture true but complete, completely false. Jesus changed the world through, through people. And Jesus changed the world one person at a time. One individual at a time, one life at a time. And one of those lives that we looked at in, the, in Jesus the Game Changer is actually the story of William Wilberforce. Now, most of you will know the story of William Wilberforce as the guy who abolished slavery in the, the British Empire. In 1807, the trading of slaves was abolished, and then in 1833, slavery uh, as a, a, a existing was abolished in the British Empire. Keep in mind, in East Africa, it still went on for years and years afterwards, which was why David, which was one of the things that David Livingston, as a missionary in East Africa, stood against. But in the British Empire, it was abolished in 1833, three days before William Fulwell actually died. He brought that to the parliament every year for 20 years before anything changed. And most of us kind of go, well, that's William Wilberforce. That's, that's his, you know, his Christian background, good on him. Well, it's interesting that that wasn't William Wilberforce's background. His dad died when he was nine. He came from a very wealthy family in Hull. Uh, he, he went to Cambridge University. He was a brilliant man, uh, brilliant with people as well. Uh, basically wasted his, rep, his time uh, at Cambridge University partying and playing cards and having a great time. But he, was, uh, he, he did pretty well because he went back to Hull and at the age of 21, he became uh, the, the member of Hull for Hull at Westminster in the Houses of Parliament. So at 21, he goes to London. He gets invited to the best clubs in London. His best mate w was William Pitt, who was the son of the Prime Minister. And William Pitt became the Prime Minister at the ripe old age of 21. Four. So William Pitt, the youngest Prime Minister of, of, of the UK, good mate of William Wilberforce's, partying his way through life. Then he goes on a, a, a tour of, of a grand tour of Europe. And a grand tour of Europe at that time was not on a river cruise and it wasn't on a nice bus. It was actually in a coach and, and carriage. And in a coach and carriage, you know, apparently back then the the Wi-Fi and the, uh, the, 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 the coverage it was even worse than it is today, you know. So you've got no phone, you've got no iPad, you've, you've got no podcast, you, you've got nothing. I mean, it's desperate, isn't it? You've got to talk to people. Goodness. And William Wilberforce spent the whole time talking to a guy called Isaac Milner. I'm going to resist telling you that there's a very interesting connection between Isaac Milner and Australia, but let's move on. So Isaac Milner is chatting to him. People in Cambridge University used to talk about Isaac Milner as being very smart. And they were discussing a particular book that was a book around faith, belief and Christianity. And after travelling all the way through Europe with Isaac Milner and his mum and an auntie and a couple of different people, he comes to the point where he believes, I believe this. I'm going to become a Christian. I'm going to follow Jesus. And he goes back to England with the decision to be a Christian. Now, you might be, some of you will be sceptical about that. Some of you who might be a part of a church would think, well, that's a good thing. He must have felt great about himself. The interesting thing about William Wilberforce is he gets back to England and he's completely depressed. And he's depressed because he thinks, I've wasted my life. I've wasted my education. 
I've wasted my life. Am I wasting my time in, in, um, in the Houses of Parliament as a parliamentarian? What, what should I do? And William Wilberforce is trying to work through, who do I talk to about this? And the only person he could think to talk to was a guy called John Newton. John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace. I keep saying this, the original version, not the one with the new hipster verse in it. So the original version of Amazing Grace was written by John Newton. Now, we probably, most of us think, oh, I must have been a songwriter. John Newton was a brilliant church leader. The church he led in the centre of London is still there. He was probably the most prominent Anglican Church of England minister in London. He used to be a slave trader. He grew up on slave ships. He was a captain of a slave ship. Long story. Resist the urge, Carl. Move on. So William Wilberforce decides he's going to go and see John Newton. Really funny story. He walked around the block seven times. He was too nervous to turn up. He didn't want anyone to see him. Anyway, he ends up talking to John Newton. He says to John Newton, you know, I've become a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. Should I leave Parliament? Should I become a minister like you? What, what should I do? I'm, I feel like I'm wasting my time. And John Newton said, you're in the right place. This is your moment. This, this is the moment that God has called you to. You should stay where you are. And William Wilberforce left that house and that conversation with two aims in his life. One, to abolish the slave trade. And two, to reform the manners of London and England. It wasn't how you use your cutlery. It was about the morals of London and England. The morals, we think morals are bad now. At that point, they, they would write that in London at that time, of all the girls that were unmarried in London, 25% of them were prostitutes. Alcohol abuse was rife from the top to the bottom of the country. It was absolutely awful. And William Wilberforce came out and gave himself to those. And the world is a different place because he did that. Was that a cultural thing? No, it's because Jesus changed his life. And Jesus changed John Newton's life. And Jesus have changed literally billions of people across the globe. And the world is a better and a different and better place because that happened. The, the issue all of us need to consider is not, oh, that's a nice cultural story, Carl. I should think about that. We all need to think about, so what's my response to this? Where do I stand in response to this? Because this is, this is actually really significant. And the idea that Christianity is this kind of cultural hangover of England that we haven't got over and we need to move on from would be a complete misrepresentation of a faith following a person, Jesus of Nazareth, which has basically changed the world and changed our lives. And it doesn't take... You don't have to be a Christian. Larry Seedentop, Rodney Stark, uh, Tom Holland, all of these people... Uh, look at history and go, you know, we're a different per group place because of this person. Thank you. And I'm going to hand back to Adam. Thank you. Carl is coming back, don't worry. Uh, thank you so much, Carl. You can still send some questions through, so we're going to try and get through as many as as possible, so you can text them through, and there'll also be some uh, helpers coming around with some microphones, so if you prefer to ask a question on the floor, uh, there'll be the opportunity to do that as, as well. But, Carl, I think someone's been very kind. I didn't get to check if this was your number, but what is the connection between Isaac Milner and Australia? <laughs> so... Oh, thank you. Who asked that? Um, Isaac Milner's brother was a school teacher and, and in, in Hull, and there's a very... So you had the Clapham sect, which is around the Clapham Common, which is what um, William Wilberforce was a part of. And the Clapham sect, there's a whole bunch of people, Josiah uh, Wedgwood, uh, John Thornton, the, the director of the Bank of London, um, quite significant people. But th there was a regional kind of offshoot, which was actually in Hull. And Hull, people, this guy ran uh, both a church and a school, and there's really deep connections with Richard... Um, Richard Johnson, who was on the First Fleet, Samuel Marsden, who followed him, and William Cowper, who came after him, who was the first kind of pastor church leader uh, rather than a chaplain. And he ran uh, York Street Church... Uh, no, um, St... 
what's that, St. Philip's in York Street in Sydney. He ran it for 40 years and died there. His son also lived for a very long time. So there's this really interesting connection between Hull, the Milner family, and those who came to Australia to bring the gospel to Australia. Amazing link. What priorities should caring for others take in a Christian's life today? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, so it, it's an interesting question, isn't it? What, what priority? It, it's in the sense that we believe that the gospel, so if I use the word gospel, I mean the message about the person of Jesus. And the gospel is a word, I'm going to talk about this tomorrow morning, is a word that actually means good news. It's not good advice, it's good news. And the gospel, if you look at, you look at the New Testament, pretty much all the way through the Bible, but look at the New Testament as well, the gospel kind of has two wings that are together. One is caring for those who need it most, the least of these, and telling people the good news that we believe. That's the news that I would believe. And those two things are important. And so it's, it's the, the place where we find a place to serve the least, the last, and the lost. That's our task. That's our job. That's, that's, we should try and find some space where we can express that value that we hold because we follow the person of Jesus. So it doesn't mean it should take everything that we do. I think one of my fears for the church is that we're becoming more a humanitarian organisation than we are somebody telling people good news. And both, both those need to be there and both of them are really important. If Jesus changed the status of women and the poor, mm. why has it taken Western Christian countries 2,000 years to acknowledge this? Uh, I, I think there's a few things in that. I don't think we like talking about it. I think that um, there, are those, there are those who would, would look at Christian countries and say, we don't do it well enough, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and that we, you know, certainly in you know, the place of women hasn't been as strong as it could have been. But... That's because we're comparing those times with now and our values now, and we're also comparing it with ourselves. We're not comparing it to other parts of the world. I mean, just look at Afghanistan since the Taliban have taken back over. I mean, that's the comparison. You know, like, I, I, that, that's the space we should be looking at, you know, and, and, I, and I think certainly, it take, certainly you've got cultural change takes a long time, uh, but... There's a whole bunch of places all over those 2,000 years where women were given opportunities through the Christian church. They weren't anywhere else. For instance, women who joined um, well, monastic orders as women. And you probably think, oh, that's a bit rough. I mean, they, you know, why would they do that? Well, they actually were given an opportunity, opportunity to learn, opportunity to serve, opportunity not just to be a, a wife and a mother, so there, there are lots of places where the church has done more than its fair share. Is it a perfect story? No. And there are plenty of people telling the not-so-good side of that story, and, and that's fair enough. That's not to say that that's not true. But one of the things I want to do, as much as we can, is to say, you know, there, there is another side. We need to look at that other side. Not to pretend it's perfect, but to say that there is places where the followers of Jesus have made a huge difference. So, quite naturally, leading on from that, in the past 100 years, although I'd say it's not just the last 100 years, there have been horrific stories yeah, terrible. of Christians not treating yeah. others in the image of God, yep. in fact committing terrible abuses most vulnerable. How and why could this be? Mm. How do we respond to that? Yeah, because um, we, in, in Towards Belief, which is the first series, I don't have that here, but it's online. Um, we, one of the episodes is on church abuse. And we talk to um, John Lennox. So Professor John Lennox, Oxford University, professor in math mathematics, but in perfect, was it perfect max or something? He's just seriously smart. Yeah. Uh, in science as well. Yes. But he grew, up in, he grew up in Belfast in the Troubles. And his dad owned a shop, a corner store, a hard, small hardware store. And when he tried to employ people from both sides of the troubles, seen as Christians, and um, they blew up his store. And his, his dad was injured by, by this. 
And John Lennox's point is this, and I would, this, is, this is the answer to the question. John Lennox's point is, those people didn't do that because they were Christian. The problem is they weren't Christian enough. That was the problem. And you, you, know, you can grow up through an institution and not reflect the values of the institution. And that's what's happened. I mean, reading the way that certain people who, in the name of Jesus, in Christian institutions have treated the vulnerable is absolutely appalling. And nobody, <laughs> the crazy thing is, nobody's more upset than people like you and I because, you know, that's totally disrespecting everything we've ever stood for. And the problem, I think, if I could rant a little, the problem is not so much that people did that because I think everybody gets that people did that. You know, like there are individuals that act outside the scope of the organisation. That happens in the scouts, that happens in public servants, it happens in the police, it happens in the, in, in the armed forces. That always happens. It is when the organisation protects itself rather than the vulnerable, that's when it becomes a problem. And people are rightfully angry about it. And, and I, I'm not going to be here to give an excuse because there is no excuse. It's appalling. If we could stop it from happening back then, we would have. Have you watched the movie Spotlight? Um, it's an old movie now, but it's actually about this issue in Boston. And it was about Spotlight was, was the, in the Boston... I'm going to bang on about this for a little bit. Was it, was, the Boston Globe had um, a, a, a group that would look, follow stories, you know, forensically follow stories. And, and, uh, and so they would look into all these different stories. And so Boston got a new... Boston, the Boston Globe got a new editor... And when he arrived, he pulled the guy aside that runs the spotlight group and he said, why aren't you looking at this story? And this guy was Jewish in his background and he pushed this reporter to start looking at the abuse in the Catholic Church. And the intriguing thing is that they go through this whole story and it's just an appalling story of moving priests around who were known as abusers and pedophiles and they were you know, like something like 11%. It was just this terrible number. They get to the end and they've written the story and, and if you're watching the movie, and my understanding, it's an accurate reflection of what happened. And, and they're all sitting around. It's about to hit the... It's been coming out the presses. Tomorrow it's on the, on, on the newsstands. The story's going to break. And they're all a bit, you know, self-righteous about what they've done. And one of the guys, the key guy, when they're in the middle of being self-righteous pushes onto the table an article and they grab the article and they look at it and the article was from like a decade before and the article had all of the facts of this story and they never followed it and they said who wrote this article and he's like I did and what what that movie actually says which I think is really important it wasn't just a church problem. It was a Boston problem. They protected the church. And it was easy to kind of blame all the priests and the, and, and the, and the um, Archbishop of Boston who then had to resign, and rightfully so. But that's not to say there isn't a broader protecting people we want to protect. And so it, that, those abuses are awful. And if any... By the way, if anybody here... Um, has suffered in anything that's like that and you're angry and bitter at the person of Jesus in the church, we would want to say to you that we're sorry. That should never have happened. And it doesn't represent what we stand for. That doesn't change what happens, but we would want, every church leader would want you to know that that's appalling, abhorrent and I was going to say unforgivable, but that's theologically incorrect. But if you get my point. So I said, I'm not a Christian and agree that Jesus has changed the world. But how can I get to know Jesus or begin exploring who Jesus is for myself? Did you write that? No. <laughs> I did not ask this. I did not write that question. That sounds like a Dorothy Dixon from the no. opposition, doesn't it? Like, I mean, the, the point is, the point about, the point I would want you, if you write that question, to take out of this is people like Tom Holland look at the evidence and go, oh, there's more here. So uh, uh, there's a few things I would, I would say to do. One of the things that people have found really helpful 
is just reading the Bible. Like actually, actually just reading the Bible. Don't get study notes and a whole bunch of stuff. Just read the Bible. And especially start with like books like Mark in the New Testament or John in the New Testament. And if you have some friends, just sit down and go, let's read this together. I don't mean out loud, but let's read these 10 verses and let's say, what, what does it say? What does it say to me? What difference would it make? And start to explore it from that point of view. No one's asking anybody to make a kind of emotional, off-the-cuff decision. But I believe that faith and Christianity and the belief in the person of Jesus is academically robust. So push back. Uh, if I can answer that by saying, there's a guy called Ian Harper. I've interviewed Ian Harper several times. You ever talked about Ian Harper? I haven't talked about him, but I know him. Yeah, you know him. Brilliant. So he's a Professor Ian Harper. John Howard had the Harper Report. That was Ian Harper. Uh, professor of um, economics at Melbourne University at one stage, or business in Melbourne University. And it, so he, his wife, though not a Christian, grew up in a church school, um, and he, they moved to Melbourne, two little kids, and his wife starts bugging him to go to church, and he doesn't want to go. And, uh, and then he just, he's just really aggravated and annoyed and said, you can't go. And then one day, he comes out on a Sunday morning, and the kids are all dressed, and she's dressed, and she says... We're going to church. She didn't go to church. She just decided she wanted to go. You know, this, exactly this question. I want to explore Christian faith. And, and, and you can do what you're going to do, but we're going to go to church. And he says, all right, if you're going to church, I'm coming, and we're going to go to the Anglican church because they're harmless. <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> and the interesting thing is, he, he, he turns up, there's a really a lot of kind of very interesting things about this story because it turns out, the guy who was, ran the church, John Harrower, actually originally had studied economics. So he knew who Harper was. And the interesting thing as well is, is Harrower had written a paper that Harper had read. So he kind of knew him. And you can imagine how Ian Harper would have looked in church, you know, pretty excited about being there. Hmm. So Harrower says to him this, I love this, I love this, don't do this, this is partially in, insensitive. But one day he's walking out of church and he sees Ian Harper and he says to Ian Harper, so how long are you going to keep coming here when you don't believe a word we say? And, and Harper says, if you can explain it in a way I'll understand, I'll listen. He said, you're on, Tuesday night, my place. <laughs> and they just started reading, doing exactly what I said. They started reading the Bible. And then, this is the point I wanted to make, then Ian Harper, John Harrower took Ian Harper to a theological library and took him to the apologetic, you know that word I said? Apologetic section. And the Harper suddenly thought, you know, I've always seen myself as an intelligent person and I realise I'm dog bone ignorant all these questions that i've thought are killer questions that there's no answers to people have been answering these questions for hundreds of years mm. and it was in that whole process and there's this beautiful scene where there's a christmas service and there was communion and and ian's sitting in the pew and i pray this would happen to this person asking the question he's sitting in the pew he's gone through all of these over all these months and he's like Hmm. what do you know? It's true. And he went forward and took communion. Mm. And uh, at the end of the service, he, John, he, Ian Harper tells this story, John Harrow comes up to him and said, you took communion, why? And Harper said, because it's true. Mm. And he, like, that's, that's what you want to explore. It's not, it's not therapeutic. It's not about, oh, it's going to make me feel better, so I should be a Christian. In fact, it'll probably make you feel worse. The question is, is it true? And people have, people, like, it's not like, oh, a couple of people have done that and discovered it has. Millions of people over a couple of thousand years have asked exactly that question and come to the point that it's true. So explore it. Read the Bible. Find some easy-to-read books. Watch a great series like, say... Jesus, the game changer. Mm. Uh, I'll give it to you free if you admit you asked that question. Mm. Well, Carl, I think that's a great place to finish. So, do you want to put your hands together and thank oh, Carl? Thank you. Thanks, guys. Do you want me to stop? Well, Carl, actually, if you stay here for a moment, right. you've been uh, so generous uh, with your time tonight. Thank you so much for your openness and sharing with us. 
Um, as people go out tonight, just a few things to share with you. First of all, as you go out tonight, there is a, a bookstall or a media stall, mm. so there are some of those resources that Carl has referred to, and you might just uh, give us a, a quick idea, Carl, of the, the yeah. things that are available there. This is, all, this is always very awkward. My good friend, Graham Ison, where is he? Gave me a hard time for having books. Uh, he's going to sell, buy every book on that stall before he goes. <laughs> Nice to see you, Graham. So, so we, we produced this stuff so it would be helpful to you. And essentially, the two seasons, so Jesus the Game Changer 1 is about, is about what we've just talked about tonight. Jesus the Game Changer 2 is looking at how did Christianity go from being the back end of the Roman Empire to being across the globe. This is filmed in 14 countries across the, across the globe. And then in the last couple of years, we haven't been able to leave home, let alone leave Australia. So we've actually created a new series called Faith Runs Deep. And it's looking at stories of Christian faith around this nation. We drive a V8 black Holden Ute around the country. That will interest about 3% of you. The <laughs> rest don't care. By the way, if you're looking at this and you think, geez, Carl, DVDs. I can't find my DVD player. The reason we have DVDs is Kurong Books tell us that people still buy them. If you, uh, I'm going to show you one other book. This is an anthology, 24 stories across Australia's history. Of, of personal stories of personal faith. It's a beautiful book. But on the, on the table, there's actually a, just a thing you can pick up is we have a streaming platform and you can get all of these for $4 a month. So you go on the streaming platform, $4 a month for your household and you can watch everything that we've ever produced. It's all there, the study groups are there, everything that, that, you will, that you will need. If you like, uh, because you can't get the net to work in your place and you still have a DVD player, or you think you can find one, we have these as well. Uh, these, these resources are all there to help people explore faith, be encouraged in their faith, be deepened in their faith, um, have some confidence in what they believe. So that's what this is all about. Would you like to thank Carl again? Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. We are so grateful that you've been able to join us tonight. I really encourage it afterwards. I'm sure if your question get answered, you could uh, have a chat to Carl over hot, hot chocolate in the foyer after. He'd be more than happy to speak with you, but make sure you check out the bookstall as well. We want to encourage you that if you would like to explore questions about who Jesus is and, and what relevance does he have for you, it would be the most profound privilege for us here at St. Bart's to help with that. And so... A really simple way to get that really rolling is just by completing a Next Steps card. So on your seats, there are some cards, and if you'd like to have a chat with someone, you can just uh, complete one of those cards, or you can scan the QR code and do that online. But if you do complete the cards, you can just pop them in some of the boxes in the foyer, or go to the Next Steps wall in the foyer when you're getting a, a hot chocolate uh, tonight, and you can have a chat to one of the teams. So it's a big green wall with Next Steps on it. You can't can't miss it. And if you join us online, you can just scan that code and complete a Next Steps card. We'd love to help you. So it doesn't matter if you're in person or online, it would be a great joy for us. So I really encourage you to do that. You can also come along tomorrow. So tomorrow we're really going to be uh, thinking about how we share the good news. So if you're a passionate follower of Jesus, you might think, yeah, I really would love to learn more about that. Just come along tomorrow. You can, you can purchase tickets uh, as you arrive. If you do come tomorrow and you haven't pre-purchased a ticket, you've just got to BYO your own lunch, that's all, but you're very welcome to come along. If you do have questions about Jesus, one way which would be so helpful to really explore some of those questions is through Alpha. So Alpha is an amazing course, it is eight weeks long, and really explores the big questions of life. It is really non-threatening, uh, amazing video material. There is some small group time. Uh, you can join in person or online. And the whole deal with Alpha is that when you come along, you can ask whatever question you want, or you can say nothing at all. It really is a no pressure environment. So I encourage you to come along, check it out. If it's not for you, that's, that's totally fine. Come along one night, see what you think. But that starts October 10. We've got a little clip that I'd love to share that just explains what Alpha is all about. Every day we ask so many questions. What should I wear? What's the weather going to be like? How am I going to fit everything in? 
But then there are those bigger questions, like why am I here? Where am I heading? Is there more to life than this? arrived at an answer to the most important issue that we humans ever deal with, is there a God? And I had arrived there without ever really looking at the evidence. And I was supposed to be a scientist. At 28, I had gotten many of the things that I thought I wanted. You know, my girlfriend was on the cover of magazines, I had a Beamer, and I was so unhappy. It was a realization maybe that I would, I would never find happiness where I was looking for it. I think for so many years, you know, I always just strive to be strong in myself. All I needed was me and my buddies and, you know, we'd be like invincible. But the truth is, none of us are. And I found purpose, I found meaning, I found hope. God took something so broken and made it a beautiful art piece. Alpha is a place where you can be yourself. You can say what you think and challenge everything. Now, no question is too complex or too simple. And what your point of view is, is as important as anyone else's. We are going on a journey together, an adventure to explore the questions of life, faith, and meaning. So if you're interested in trying out Alpha, just complete a, a Next Steps card and uh, you can go see one of the Next Steps team in the foyer, but please do stay afterwards, join us for hot chocolate, we'd love to chat, love to meet you and also answer any questions that you might have. But right now as we close, I'd just love to pray for us all. Gracious God, we thank you so much for your goodness, for your love and for your grace. Lord, we are so sorry for the times in which we have got it wrong. Pray that you would really help us to learn more about who Jesus is, his significance for us and for the whole world, that we might be growing in our knowledge of your love for us and our love for you. Lord, we thank you so much that we've been able to gather here this night. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>